Oh, good evening, everybody. It's Reformation Sunday, which means is it's Lutheran Super Bowl. That's how I look at it. And in order to win a Super Bowl, you've got to have a strategy, don't you? You've got to have a game plan. You've got to have players, and they've got to execute that plan in order to win. So today we're going to look at God's game plan in us. But before we can talk about his game plan, we've got to know the rules to the game. How else are you supposed to play? And Jesus sums that up very simply by telling his disciples to love. To love as I love you. That's the rule. That's how we're supposed to live. And as long as you love and don't break that rule, you're great. But then the question is, who are we to love? And again, Jesus talks to his disciples and to a rich man to help explain that more. We're supposed to love our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. So we're supposed to love, and the people we're supposed to love is God and our neighbor. And I love the point he says here, and uh, this, these commandments, the law and the prophets hinge on it. Oh, that helps. And so we're supposed to love God and love our neighbor. Well, how do we do that? How do we love God? How do we love our neighbor? We get these wonderful Ten Commandments in the back there to help show us how to love people. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read the Ten Commandments, I realize my scoreboard's a little bit on the low side. I kind of don't live up to what this has to say. And it kind of kills me right here. So my question for all of you is, how's your scoreboard? How are you feeling? And before you say, oh, it's not too bad, I got some questions to ask you. How much of a challenge was it was to get everybody together to get here tonight? Is there any tension you're having with the person you're sitting next to? How's work going? How about after work, between work and going to sleep? Any temptations that are going on here, around here, up in your head? And what happens is, is your body realizes that we're messing up this law that God has put down for us to love one another. And you feel heartbroken because you realize there's a price to pay. Just like in football, there's a penalty when you break the rules. Problem is this penalty is death, a separation from God. And that breaks our heart. What's even worse is sin gets in there and makes it even like feel worse on us. Because you start asking yourself, since you've broken the rules, should I be here in church right now? These people seem to be better than who I am. Should I be here? Should I even be praying to God right now? He's not going to listen to my prayers. I'm not good enough. Should I even be calling myself a Christian? I'm not good enough for that. What happens is that affects us right here and brings us down. So what's the game plan? How do we get out of that? What are we to do? Well, for God's game plan, it doesn't involve us. See, what he did was he came down. He put the pads on himself and got on the field. He lived with those troubles, those tensions on your heart. He fent those temptations. And he died on the cross. Now, why did he do that? The scriptures make this point. It's a sacrifice of atonement. If there's a price to pay for breaking the rules, and if that's death and away from God, Christ took on that penalty for all of us. So all those troubles you have in your heart, all those things are going on in your mind, you get to bring it up there because he took that all on for us. He makes us righteous, which is another big word, and what that means is we're right with God. So can you call yourself a Christian? Yes, because you're right with God. Can you actually pray to God? Does he listen to you? Yes, because you can come to him because you're right with God. And do you belong here worshiping together and giving praise and worship to God? Yes, because you're right with God. That's his game plan. He did all this for us so we can be right with him. That's the gospel message. And that's what's so special about today. Reformation, why we got the red on and the music and everything happening. Because we got to celebrate how God came into our lives redeemed us, took this all off of us. But sadly, for the church, that's not always our history. We go back 500 years ago, 
our church, I'm very specific about that, not the Roman church, our church, then always proclaimed the gospel. In fact, they uh, had this about 500 years ago, needed to build a new chapel. Might have heard of it. It's called the Sistine Chapel. Not the 16, though I, I've accidentally said that a few times myself. And you pay for something like this. So what did they do? They gave out indulgences. You could buy these to get God's blessing on your life. You can be given forgiveness. You can be given time out of purgatory. Your relatives that are dead, you can get one of these for them. And people flocked to buy these because they thought this was the gospel. So 498 years ago, a monk named Martin Luther went out there and nailed a 95 thesis to the church door, and by the way, a thesis means a statement, asking the church to step up, the leadership to say, hey, this is wrong. We've got to get back to the gospel. Now you might ask me and go, well, Vicar, this is really matter now. This is 498 years ago. And I say, yes, because the American church would gladly buy indulgences if we said it was okay. How do I know that? Because people love buying stuff like this. Paper that you can buy that gives you the blessings of God. If you follow this, you'll be right with God in your life. People today feel this is the gospel. This is what scares me. So let's get back to the actual scriptures. Now I asked many people today, if you walked in, that if you had a Bible to grab that, we're going to go to the book of Romans, where our epistle reading is from today. And Romans is a letter Paul's writing to, to the church in Rome. Let's think about it. It's a Christian church in a city that's powerful, has a lot of money, has a lot of education, full of culture, different religions, ways of thinking. Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? And here Paul describes to us God's game plan. And for those who have uh, grabbed the Bible, it's page 1114. And Paul starts off discussing how we are all accountable to the law. We all have to follow. We all have to love. And if we don't, there's a penalty that, for that. But he doesn't leave the Romans there. Instead, he lets them know that there's this gift, this promise of Christ. And this promise is found in the law and the prophets. Now, we might have heard that already. Jesus said that earlier in a sermon. It's also in the gospel reading, the law and the prophets. So what is it? So this is the Bible. The law and the prophets is the Old Testament. So if you look at a Bible, that's about 75% of it is the law and the prophets. I asked people this week, if you could point to me where the law and where the gospel is in the Bible, where would you do it? And just about everybody with their very first response was, oh, easy. Old Testament's law, New Testament is the gospel. But then I asked the question, really? And most of them, after thinking a couple of seconds, goes, well, isn't the law and the gospel throughout all Scripture? Exactly. And that's what Paul is pointing to in our reading, is, a, is that the promises of Christ, God's redemption, his game plan, is throughout all of the Old Testament. In fact, there's more gospel in the Old Testament than in the New Testament. Because it's larger. That's what Paul's getting to about Jesus. Are these promises of God are throughout Scripture? For those who have your Bibles open, I want you to think about this quote from Martin Luther. The Bible is the cradle where the Christ is laid. Right there in front of you is where you can find Christ, the Word of God. When you have those struggles on your heart and on your mind, you can go right there to the Scriptures in front of you. So let's get back to Paul, what he has to say now. He lets us know that no matter who believes in Jesus, doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, the gospel message is meant for everybody. It doesn't matter your background, 
who you are, what you grew up with. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past. All get the redemption of Christ with faith in him. Then we have this large section up here, and this is where Paul describes how we receive this, this righteousness. Christ is a sacrifice of atonement. That is, that Christ takes on our debts, our sins, our struggles on the cross. He paid the price so we don't have to. God followed the rules and somebody had to pay the penalty, and that person was Jesus. But because of that, we are now righteous, right with God. Paul ends letting us know about this idea of boasting. Where is your sense of security? Do you feel like you can trust yourself, what you've done, how you're living? I don't think so. That's not what the law shows us. So where can we have a sense of security? Where can we have our faith in? It's knowing that God came down and worked on our lives for us. God took all that on for us so we don't have to. That's where our faith is at. So I thought about for this week, how does us as a church share Paul's message? How do we describe it? How do we show it to those around us? And then I realized something. It's October 24th. What happens in eight weeks? Christmas. We have the church here starting up. We have holidays and seasons happening that actually help describe what Paul's talking about in Romans. So when you come to church and see this going out, when you bring family and friends, you can share why we're celebrating these different things. But someone asks you, what, what's with Christmas? Why are you celebrating Lent? You can share the meaning of that holiday, but also share the entire game plan of God. So Advent. Advent starts right after Thanksgiving, and it's a time where we look and uh, anticipate the coming of Christ. We look at the promises found in the law and the prophets that God's about to fulfill. Then there's Christmas, Jesus' birthday. But it's more than that. It's the day we realize that God came down to us. It's the day that God put on the pads, took on flesh, lived with us, suffered with us. But after Christmas, after a couple of weeks, we have this day called Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday focuses on the beginning of what Paul has to say. It's a day we remember that we are all accountable to the law. And boy, do we fall short. But that kicks off a different season in the church, season of Lent. We all love Lent, right? That's the time to give up Coke and chocolate for 40 days. But it's more than that. Of course we know that. It's a time we reflect on our own lives and realize that we can't live up to this law. That Christ faced these temptations. Only he could take these off our hearts. We had this day called Good Friday. And people ask, why do you call it Good Friday if that's the day you celebrate Jesus dying? It's not just Jesus. God died that day. God took on all of our sin, all the things that were wrong. He paid the price that day. And as we give ourselves up there for him to take on, we realize he says this, it is finished. And that Sunday we get to rejoice. If Reformation is Lutheran Super Bowl, then this is the Super Bowl for all Christians. This is the day we celebrate that our, season, our Savior has risen. He has risen indeed. Hallelujah. This is Easter. This is where I get to have my faith. This is where I get to have my security on, is knowing that my Lord is alive on Easter. Fifty days later, we have Pentecost. And this is the day the Spirit came down the apostles, filled them up so they can speak, preach the gospel in all kinds of different languages. A reminder is what Paul wrote. The gospel is for all Jews and Gentiles. It's for everybody. And I end with, from a reading from Revelation. Then I saw another angel flying in, in midair. And he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live in the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. We've heard God's game plan for our lives, what he's done for us. But there are people out there who don't know it. 
like the angel, we have this eternal gospel that we need to go out there and share. Please pray with me.